to give uh, uh, about three minutes presentation on behalf of the one of our speakers, which is uh, uh, Mr. Su and Wang Su from the Xinan Weibo, because he couldn't make the, uh, the IGF uh, due to the visa issues. So after that, we prepared uh, about uh, three questions to each uh, our speakers. So uh, we, then we will open the floor to invite your comments and uh, any questions. So we will get a response from our uh, seven speakers. Then in the end, we will wrap up the panel. Okay. So should I speak? Uh, should I start with the introduction to each, uh, of each speaker? So first of all, we would like to introduce Mina. So maybe Mina can say a little bit about herself. Thank you very much. My name is Mina Aslama Horowitz. I am a researcher at the University of Helsinki in a project called Communication Right in the Digital Era. Um, I am also an um, advocacy expert at the Central European University that just moved to Vienna, as some of us might know, from Budapest, and um, I teach also in New York. Okay, so Isaac, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isaac Rutenberg. I am a lecturer and the director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore University, which is in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, Amita, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm the co-workshop holder for this. Uh, my name is Amrita Chaudhary. I'm from India. I run an organization called CCAOI. We work on capacity building, research and policy, and we have been involved at ground level in building uh, capacity, especially amongst youth on media literacy, digital literacy, and we're doing some research on whether um, digital illiteracy has any effect on the um, on the perception of people to misinformation because India is having issues due to a lot of misinformation which is being spread. Okay, Michael, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Irishewo Michael. I'm from Zambia. I work for the Zambia Police Service. I am a law enforcement officer there. Uh, basically, my area of specialization is cybersecurity. I'm also involved in various internet governance activities. Um, the past uh, under government stakeholder mark members outgoing after this IGF, I leave the mark. Uh, basically, my coming here is to speak on behalf of governments in Africa on matters to do with misinformation, trust, and responsibility. Mm, uh, though I may not represent an actual country or single government, but my voice and views will be that generally for the general governments in Africa. Thank you. Valida? Thank you. Uh, uh, Valida. Well, Okay, okay, Walid Al Sakaf is my name. I'm a senior lecturer at Södertörn University in Stockholm, Sweden, and my specialty mostly is in media technology, internet studies, internet governance, obviously, and journalism. And of course, uh, this intersection between technology and journalism is where I am interested in, particularly in disinformation mm -hmm. and fact checking, as uh, well as uh, I have a technical degree in computer engineering, so I can bring in both academic and technical capacities. Thank you. Yes, and Ansaga, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ansgar Kuhne. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Nottingham's Horizon Digital Economy Research Institute. And for the last couple of years, together with the University of Oxford and Edinburgh, we've been uh, running a couple of research projects looking at how young people are interacting with the internet and particularly algorithmically mediated um, services there. So questions about how recommender systems and such things impact uh, young people's experiences. I also chair an IEEE standards working group to develop an algorithmic bias consideration standard. And since recently, I am the global AI ethics and regulatory leader at EY. Okay, Professor Xie. Uh, Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm come from Beijing University of Posts and uh, Telecommunications. My uh, study field uh, focuses on the cyber law and especially the uh, personal information and the data uh, security and so on. Thanks. 
Okay, uh, as everybody can see, we have very, very diverse, uh, diversified panel, and they have come from different background disciplines like computer science, law, and the social science, the media and communication, law and, and the government sectors. So actually, the aim of our workshop is to you know identify the impact, explore the impact of this information and fake news. On, both uh, nation, uh, nation state and individual level, and uh, look at uh, what steps or measures has been taken already, you know, to under, uh, to filter this kind of disinformation fake news. Now, also we want to explore, propose some new idea or possible solution to move us forward. So uh, I will open the panel by doing, uh, as I said, uh, doing presentation, short presentation on behalf of the Xinan Weibo's uh, chief, uh, deputy chief editor, Mr. Wang Shu. Uh, he couldn't make it due to the visa issues. So, yes. So first of all, uh, they would like to introduce the, I mean, well, I, I believe most of you already know about the Xinan Weibo, which is the biggest, largest social media platform in China, and it has more than 200 million active users every day. And they release like 160 million messages per year. So they, besides their text, you know, micro blog, they also have different like, uh, functions, like uh, live broadcasting, and the pay the increase, and the, different applications, short video photos. So how do they uh, refuter the ru rumors in Weibo? Uh, rum uh, actually, uh, Weibo, um, Xinjiang microblog, is a kind of regarded, it's different from the Tencent, uh, Tencent WeChat, because Tencent WeChat is more closed. It's like a WhatsApp, private. And, uh, but the micro blog, Weibo, is more open platforms. So, so the rumors uh, is uh, circulate quite wildly, you know, uh, in the Weibo platforms. So, first of all, they, uh, Weibo officially launched a portal for refuting rumors, and they established some official account of rumor, uh, refuting rumors uh, official account. So, use the account, they can collect daily rumors and publicize them. Also, they push the uh, your filtery message to the subscribers or to the uh, audience. So the, at the present, the reading volumes of these topics is close to six billion. So they have an official account which to collect, fill, uh, also you know, push the refuting message to their subscribers. So they also have a, the second mechanism they adapt is what they call the label, so labeling. Uh, so for some, uh, some rumors that are already identified, so they will uh, label this as a rumors. Then this message will not be deleted immediately, but will be spied on the label of the rumors and become the uh, lateral message for refuting rumors. And actually they give the special privilege to the, some uh, trusted or professional bodies. So if this professional organization or the a uh, high credit media company uh, identify these uh, uh, rumors. They will uh, give them more private, uh, privilege to label this portal, label these rumors. So also the third mechanism they use is a user credit system. This one is a bit controversial because uh, they also uh, launch this user credit system for the rumor propagators. So if they, uh, you, if the user has uh, released the rumor once or twice, and the penalty will be reduction of the score in different level. So they will identify these rumor propagators. So when the score is reduced below six points, it will be restricted to Bowser, part of the content. Also, uh, they will give some users a corresponding reminder of warnings. Uh, warnings. For example, if you look at the case percent of the posters, by both parties. So every day, you know, they have a, a 2,000, sometimes 2,000, sometimes 3,500 report about the disinformation rumors. In here, uh, they say the false information, which include disinformation and the fake news. And uh, also look at the false information daily process capacity. And they released the rumors or disinformation every day between like uh, 200 to 205, so there's a range, you know, 
how many rumors or disinformation they labeled and process every day. So I think uh, this is a brief, uh, brief uh, introduction about the mechanism they use uh, by the Sinan Weibo for labeling, uh, identified how to deal with the rumors. Of course, if you have any further questions, you can either, sorry, either email the Mr. Uh, Su Wang, or you can ask me later, because I, he said that I can you know, answer some of the questions on behalf of him. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, his email address. So now I, I would like to open the panel discussions. So the first question I would like to ask all of the speakers is about uh, uh, whether you, uh, what, why, why is the reason for the proliferation of the rumors or disinformation, or fake news, you know, in different uh, countries or regions or in different uh, platforms? Can you give us some, because I know there's a different reasons, can you, but there's uh, some similarity as well. Can you give us a shorter you know, introduction about the reasons for the proliferation of the rumor and the disinformation? Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. So I come from Finland, and uh, Finland is often hailed as the uh, poster so uh, child of a country that can actually fight against rumors, disinformation, trolling, uh, and so on and so forth. But, but let me first say, I feel very old, because I'm somebody who has been uh, studying communication rights, and I, I would just like to say that I come from the perspective that, when, especially when we talk about misinformation and the trust, we also talk about social trust and democra democratic participation, not only technological issues. So I just want to get it out there, and sorry, I am so old-fashioned, but this is what I wanted to say. Why I often think about this issue of why is uh, misinformation um, different in different contexts? Of course, this is because different contexts have different vulnerabilities. And I often think about it as macro, meso, and micro, meaning macro vulnerabilities. If a society is going through turmoil, uh, there's a lot of political, economic, and so on turmoil, of course, there is more, more societal uh, possibilities and, and opportunities for misinformation. Then we have the meso level of media systems, and now I'm saying media systems, not only the internet and platforms, but also the media. And then in those contexts, vulnerability also is a micro level vulnerability of those individuals and groups who might be targeted or who might not be media literate. So as a social scientist, I just want to set the stage that I think we can think about reasons why different contexts differ and why different forms of misinformation and distrust take different shapes, even in a global era. Yes, and as I from the legal background, maybe we can give us uh, some ideas. Sure, thanks. And uh, just to mention, I'm also sitting in for my colleague, Arthur Guagua, who was supposed to be on this panel, but didn't make it for visa reasons as well. Uh, I do teach in a law school, although I, I think my comments won't be terribly legal at this, at this point. Um, in Kenya, you have, I think you have to look at the platform that is used in order to understand the, the motivation or the, the, the proliferation of uh, of fake information, and that, and that is that in Kenya, the most, the most used uh, form of social media is by far um, WhatsApp. So a lot, there's a, there is Facebook, there is what's, uh, Twitter and other social media platforms and Instagram, but, but WhatsApp is used by the vast majority of the population to, to spread information. And the problem with that is that you receive WhatsApp information uh, or WhatsApp messages almost exclusively from people that you know. And because of that, I think it's very easy for information that is not true to be perceived as true much, mm -hmm. much more readily as mm -hmm. opposed to being blasted on social media where you don't necessarily know the source. Uh, people assume that when they receive a WhatsApp message that it is probably going to be true or at least there's some truth to it. The other, the other issue is that uh, <clears throat> in a culture or in a society where 
uh, it's very some of the craziest things you can think of are actually quite believable. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the reports that I receive on my WhatsApp are, are, I can tell that they're false, but I also see that, yeah, I mean, the average person who doesn't study these things might actually believe that the government is capable of doing something like this, or that some private company is 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 out to do this sort of thing. And so, in a culture where there's where rule of law is always an issue. I think uh, it's it's even more difficult to distinguish r fake news from 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 real news, and that that's something that adds to the proliferation, the the rampant proliferation of these uh, WhatsApp messages. Okay, I would like to also uh, maybe go back to Professor Shi, but after Amita, because I know in India, you know, the WhatsApp is also very important uh, in paying the these kind of yes. functions. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, Misinformation or fake news has always been there from time immemorial. Only thing is technology is aggravating it. Uh, the spread is faster. Um, and as I said, it is from whom your most of the messages which you receive in communication devices are from your trusted people whom you trust, so you uh, kind of believe it. For example, in the 21 lynching cases which happened in India, uh, the message was sent, uh, spread through the communication device, and in most of the cases, people thought they were doing a social good. The message was there is a ki child kidnapper who is out to kidnap children, and that's how people spread it. It was a social good they thought they were doing. Unfortunately, it was causing harm to someone or leading to someone's death. So. Um, what we have seen through our work at the grassroots levels is the trust factor is very difficult for people to understand, especially when digital literacy or even basic literacy is an issue and language is an issue. Most Indians are not English speaking and we have the second largest internet users and we have a population which is coming onto smartphones uh, and using internet because we have the the cheapest internet possible in the uh, world currently. So those are certain uh, issues. And as he mentioned, the current situation, the political turmoils, and there are actors who are actually spreading, uh, pushing information uh, with certain uh, objective that is scary. Mm. OK, may I just jump to the Professor She because also you have these uh, rule of law issues in China, OK? So I would like to know also, is there any impact of the legal system also on the, yeah, the rumors. Okay. Uh, as we know, uh, the, this uh, decentralized, uh, decentralization of the internet means that everyone is a journalist and everyone is an adult. This has led to a flood of the dis disinformation and fake news. And according to the episodes survey, 48% of the respondents say that they have believed a, a story which turned out to be fake. And only 41% think that the average person can tell fake news apart. This uh, directly undermines people's trust on the internet. And uh, as we know, there are more than 800 million internet uses in China. Maybe uh, a fake news, maybe uh, in some countries, there are one, only one person believe it, but in China, there may be 10 person uh, believe it. So the fake news maybe in China, they have a more, uh, have a bigger market. So someone can to, uh, to scrub the, the attention of, of the users, maybe to become the uh, so, uh, oh, oh, yeah, the celebrity on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Celebrity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so yeah, can I can we move to the like uh, Michael and uh, also uh, yeah, well, like, because of you have uh, experience from Zambia, Zambia <laughs> from Africa actually. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's Africa. It's not country yeah. country based. Yeah. Eh? From the other side. Not from other yes. side. <laughs> Thank you. From Africa. Uh, so basically, looking at. Sorry? Okay, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, basically, looking at fake news or misinformation or whatever fancy name we may try to call it has always been there. But uh, unfortunately, initially, it was coming from government in form of propaganda. Mm -hmm. 
because government had the tools of information dissemination. The tools we have right now, which includes the internet, social media, are a new form of disseminating, which has given power to the citizens now to have the freedom of expression. Unfortunately, there are, personally, I see three reasons why there is a proliferation of uh, misinformation online. The first one is lack of the legal structure, meaning that we, they are in Africa, basically, there are very few countries, if none, that has laws that pertains to the control and or flow of information, meaning that there should be some, of course, penalties for spreading fake news. So the first thing is there is lack of laws. The second one is the inertia in terms of reaction to statements by most governments. Most governments are too slow to respond to stories that are flying all over social media platforms. I'll give an example of WhatsApp. WhatsApp is not like Facebook. On Facebook, if I post something that everyone else deems to be fake, believe you me, the comments I'm going to see will dispel that statement. But on WhatsApp, because it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if it's not in a group, you receive it, as my brother said, it's from a trusted source. So basically, people out there just feel like they've read something, believing it is true, they'll forward it. The moment they place the send button, it means the whole world will receive it. As a result, it moves within trusted circles. It doesn't move in circles where it's random. No, it moves within trusted circles. The third one is on the aspect of the private sector, meaning those, uh, these companies that actually hold the infrastructure and the tools for communication. I'll give an example of WhatsApp. WhatsApp has a policy now which controls how many times one can forward a message. As of last week, I know it was just in a single 24-hour period, one was only allowed to transmit, to, to forward 20 messages. Beyond 20, you cannot forward. Mm -hmm. I hope they limit it be, uh, below five. five. Oh, I, I didn't know about India. <laughs> uh, generally in Africa, it's 20 times you can forward the message. So basically that will limit the flow of misinformation. So to, to look at all these three uh, reasons uh, I've given, it's, it, all, it, it all goes down to the level at which us humans now have access to all the tools that initially were not in our hands. Mm. Others do it for political reasons. Others do it for hate reasons. Others for racial reasons. There are so many various reasons people actually send information. Others know that the information they are sending is wrong. Others do it for fun. Others do it to be seen to be up to date with technology, and yet what they are doing is wrong. So basically, there are various reasons, but among them is that it's the availability of the tools. It's the inability of the government to respond and to enact laws that are going to stop the vices in terms of penalizing people who are spreading fake news. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, Malita, I know you're based in Sweden at the moment, but you have Middle East background. Maybe you can talk a little bit from both, you know, experience. Absolutely. Thank I you. may not look like a typical Swede, do I? <laughs> um, but I come from Yemen originally, and uh, in the Middle East is where I've been uh, doing uh, some substantial research on how does information, disinformation, misinformation spread. But I would like to draw also comparisons, or let's say uh, commonalities, with the spread of information anywhere around the world. It's basically driving attention is the main cause. It's like, how do I drive attention? And now, in the past, when you used to have you know, regular print journalism um, products, a newspaper art uh, article would be with, alongside, bought of some text. So the body would represent the article. But nowadays, in order for you on the internet to have the person click, you actually need to incentivize the person because it's a two-step process. So the, there's a, a Marshall McLuhan's popular s s phrase of the media is the message. And now the internet is itself become the message. The way w the internet is composed, the web, for example, forces us to think in new ways in which we incentivize the public to click on something. And that's driving disinformation because it generates more opportunity to create income, to create uh, sources of, uh, and sometimes it's uh, illegal forms of income, but eventually, as my good friend mentioned, there are not many consequences to it. Accountability is missing online. Mm -hmm. So there's a 
a number of factors that play into the hands of the, those who spread this information. And they need to be done not only in a government top-down approach, but also from a bottom-up approach, mm -hmm. looking at it, into it from a media literacy approach. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Uh, because a lot of individuals may not understand that whatever they receive could be you know, fake. Another thing is also using professionals such as journalists. And it's really unfortunate that sometimes journalists themselves fall to the, in the trap of spreading false information. I'll give you a typical example that happens during election campaigns when you have various uh, political candidates promoting certain information as if it were correct. They promote this information and realize, maybe not too late, that this information was actually false. So you're now in, uh, propagating the misinformation. So fact-checking in itself is necessary for the first stage in which you get uh, raw information and ensure that whatever you provide online or offline is accurate. So I would like to emphasize on that perhaps and make sure that we understand that the technology also allows us to fact-check quicker if you have the skills to do so. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Marita already touched my second question, but uh, I would like to hear Ansaga's uh, you know, experience first before we turn to the second question. Okay, thank you. So yes, so uh, I'm based in the UK, and as you may know, there are some elections going on at the moment. Um, and pretty much from the very beginning when these elections were started, more or less the first couple of stories that we started to hear were various political parties accusing each other of uh, spreading misinformation. Uh, and an interesting aspect of this is the kind of defense that we heard for certain of this misinformation was that they were saying, well, yes, we slightly doctored this video, but we did it to make it more fun. We made it so that it's just more attention grabbing because um, the, the core of it is supposedly still true. And by the way, we have a different copy of this video on our site where you can see the real one. So what it highlights is the way in which um, making the message something that uh, goes viral is a driving factor behind uh, some of these things. Uh, a outrageous message is something that people will, be, will tend to want to share more, so you're going to want to exaggerate things. Additionally, Now, this is, of course, something that isn't completely new. Tabloid newspapers, the UK is infamous for their tabloid newspapers, have always been doing this. But now, as has been mentioned, you find more of a blurring of where does this information actually come from. It's coming through your friend circles. And for instance, if we look at our interactions with young people online, they also feel very strongly due to the kind of gamification of the system. You are constantly basically being um, pushed to try and share many things to get the message out there before your other uh, friend in the friend circle gets it out there. So it's whoever gets, spreads the message first sort of gets a kind of um, credit to, uh, within the group, which means it, it lowers the, um, the, critic, the critical assessment before sharing something, which is a contributing factor that effectively comes in due to design decisions that were made into the social media because the platforms want people to constantly be sharing things in order to keep them to be on the platform. Okay, thank you. I think um, actually our last uh, second question is about actually the measures has been adapted, you know, in different uh, regions, countries, or states, you know, and the measure could be as we or some some of our speaker already point out, maybe legal, technical, or capacity building or platform from platforms. So I would like to invite all the speaker if you haven't yeah, touched this question. I would also like to add if when we are, we are talking about what measures, if they see best practices, which has been taken and perhaps they would also want to elaborate on what could be good, as in what measures do they think should be encouraged more within when they're talking about best practices. I think that would help. Yes. Yeah. Also, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if you could also propose, you know, in your opinions, what is the best practice for the future? Okay, please, Mina. Um, as if you've been following the misinformation and combating misinformation uh, conversations, what's often said about Finland, which I currently research, is that we combine press freedom and media literacy, media literacy from school on. But I would like to add to that that this, of course, is not a, a uh, foolproof formula because we do need 
multi-stakeholder or uh, several org organizations and institutions uh, collaborating. And in many Nordic countries, as, as in Sweden, we do have public service media who have been doing media literacy training as part of their remit as public service institutions. Now they've taken on uh, uh, fake, uh, misinformation, uh, media literacy education, uh, also documentaries and such. Uh, so talking about these issues. But what we also see in the country that is ranking top notch in, in all these rankings is that we've done some longitudinal research on, on Finnish people. And what we unfortunately see is uh, both in service and qualitative research that Finns, each and every one of them, think of themselves very media literate. They are very sure that they can tell apart fake news or false information and propaganda and the real thing. But what they do not trust are, are platforms, me legacy media institutions, and one another. And I think for us to try and start to tackle these problems, we also have to tackle it from the sociological perspective and understand how people truly experience distrust, trust, and uh, in, in its different forms. Okay, yeah. Sending so legal measures has been adopted across the countries? Yeah, um, so at, at my law school, we've been aggregating the laws of technology and I, ICT laws from across the continent, the, the 55 countries in Africa, and looking at the different laws that exist. <laughs> In Kenya, we have, and we have had actually a law that makes the dissemination of fake information illegal for over, for almost 20 years now. And, and in fact, last year we, or two years ago we passed, last year we passed another law that is now specific to cyber crimes and says uh, the dissemination of, inf of information over the internet or over some computer network is also illegal. Whether It was already illegal, but now it's even more illegal perhaps. <laughs> um, and so the laws are there. Uh, and in, across Africa, we see that there are many countries that have these laws. Um, I'm not so sure about the implementation, though. And I think that uh, I don't know of any examples of, in, in Kenya, private individuals taking anyone to court over the dissemination of, of, of fake news or, or disinformation. And, and typically, the government will, will do it only in, in very extreme cases or particularly where the, the information is against the government. Um, but, uh, but, but just making up stories, making up misinformation uh, is, is, is something that is illegal, but it's, the implementation is hard. The, other, the only thing I'd add to that, though, is that um, it's not just a cyber crime issue. It's also an competi anti-competition issue. Mm -hmm, uh, yes, it can course. be a, a, a private, well, a, a, a market-based solution, perhaps, saying, well, your dissemination is, is wrong and you're, dis and you're, you're, you're uh, discouraging competition and that sort of thing. And then very lastly, we do have um, a lot of people doing research in this area. I'll mention that um, a lady from Nigeria won the UNESCO L'Oreal Science Award just, this, just a few days ago, and her dissertation her PhD dissertation was called Detecting Misinformation with Proof and Deep Learning Models and Nature-Inspired Algorithms. So mm -hmm. the research is definitely being done. Uh, I think it's a challenge of implementation. Okay. Can I ask Professor Shea about it? Because Professor is also a law professor. So, so how about the legal situation in China in terms of misinformation, fake, fake news? And so uh, regulating the fake news, uh, Maybe we can use the law or the administrative measures and uh, maybe the technology measures. But I think in the, uh, inter uh, on the internet, because the, the law is not the most important measure to control the, the uh, fake news. I think maybe the uh, technology will be the best one to, uh, to regulating the uh, fake news, uh, because we, uh, as we know, the most uh, part of the data and the, the technology was held by the uh, company, uh, and they have the data and have the uh, technology to deal with the fake news. There are so much uh, fake news on the internet. It's hard for the government to to do it with the uh, administrative measures to, to control it. 
So just uh, uh, the technology and just maybe uh, as the AI and this, such others can be more efficiency to, to deal with the fake news. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Xi. So I think, Michael, you have uh, no, uh, no enforcement experience. So how do you feel the, the implementation enforcement of the law, if there is a law, whether it's uh, good or it's effective, efficient? Uh, basically, just to add on what my brother here said on the Kenyan experience, is that we've had laws. Like in Zambia, we had this law, which was called publication of, of uh, false news. Which, is not, which has been now struck off from the penal court. So basically, if you look at it, those were more like offline laws, because it says publication of false news. To define publication in the era of uh, social media and the availability of the internet will not be the same way we interpret publication in the sense that those days, to publish, you have to go to a publishing company. You must approach a like, broadcasting company to do it on your behalf. So basically, that law has now been outlawed. It's mm -hmm. no longer, I'm speaking from the Zambian experience, it's no longer applicable. Like if you publish uh, false news, then you are in for it. Unfortunately, some of these laws now are being sneaked into the cybercrime bills because of the nature of uh, the technology that currently is in use, as is right if put it. Unfortunately, most of these laws whether punitive or semi-punitive, attracts the attention of uh, and the condemnation of the civil society. In as much as the government, speaking from the law enforcement side, in as much as you are trying to bring sanity to the cyberspace, in as much as you want to bring accountability to the cyberspace, there will be others who feel like you are trampling on their rights. Those who always complain. You leave it open like that where you say, okay, no laws, Again, the same citizen whose uh, rights will be trampled because a lot of false information will be paid up, uh, against them. So basically, from the law enforcement point of view, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not quite easy because if somebody is defamed on Facebook, yes, you see the defamation, but of course you need a data preservation order for Facebook to preserve that information. So that in the, in, on the day you go to court, you present it in the court of law. Because if you don't get the preservation order, the person who could have uh, pr uh, probably displayed false information about you can easily delete it because they have access to to to, to post and delete. Meaning that, in as much as it can just be a matter of seconds, they can delete it. Mm -hmm. You go to court, you go to the police station, you go anywhere. That information is not there online. Yeah. We don't have the tools to determine what was posted 30 minutes ago after it's been deleted because each one has the control of what they post or what they are not supposed to post. So basically, it's a very difficult fight. Of course, in the absence of laws, nothing can be done. Yes, thank you. So anyone wants to add? I know uh, Asaka is from the computer science background. The Vanita, do you want to add anything about legal perspective? But we will come back to the fact checking and also algorithm, yeah. Um, uh, well, I'm not a lawyer myself, but from a technical perspective, uh, I can imagine that there might be some solutions. Um, we were uh, yesterday at a, a session on the Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Technology, and one interesting aspect, I know not many are in favor of blockchain nowadays, but one interesting aspect of blockchain is preserving data. I mean, making it impossible or immutable to delete, delete data. Yeah. I mean, that might be problematic in some cases where you have privacy issues, but technology is there, and there are methods in which you can actually, for example, if you were tracking a particular thing and you ended up in a position of having to store the data in a way that's immutable, then you have that option. But it's, it's difficult to see to it that this will be main general practice. The, my point here is that if there are strong inten incentives to do something in, with technology, you can do it. The underlying question is, is it feasible? Is it possible to do by the mainstream? Uh, how much training do you need? Capacity building? All those questions are an, an additional hindrance. Yes. And Asaka, um, you want to come back to law or you want to talk about the AI and the blockchain? I will try to bridge them. Um, so briefly, basically, in the UK kind of context, uh, there isn't really any direct um, conversation about putting in laws 
to uh, block misinformation. The focus has been more on questions of hate speech as far as uh, potential new legislation is concerned. So there is a, a um, white paper on that, which hasn't moved forward because of other political debates going on. Um, however, there is a new piece of legislation that it has uh, come into effect as part of the Data Protection Act 2018, which is specific to the rights and protections of young people, the age-appropriate design. Um, and what this does is that it limits the kinds of information that platforms will be able to collect on young people, which is anybody below 18, and the way in which they would be able to use this to do targeting on them. Now, this doesn't directly um, address the misinformation question, but it does potentially change the dynamics of mm -hmm. how the information will be flowing because it will affect the way in which the uh, recommendation systems, uh, the news feeds, and those kinds of things will be acting. So if we think about um, possible technical solutions to mm -hmm. these, uh, because often that is sort of the direction in which you're hearing things, that uh, when the uh, political sphere doesn't really see how to address the issue. Uh, the first stage is to turn to the technology companies and say, well, please make it go away. Um, use your platforms uh, with some kind of filters or something like that to make sure that misinformation uh, is either removed as quickly as possible or is even blocked from coming online to begin with. Now, this is quite challenging. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if we're thinking, for instance, of misinformation in the form of text, which is somewhat different from misinformation in the form of images and videos, yes. two different kinds of challenges. For instance, in the, in the case of text, yes, we can use uh, natural language processing to do analysis of text. However, we need to keep in mind that machines in natural language processing the machines don't actually understand text in the human kind of way. Basically, it's about statistics as text. So if somebody uses the same kind of pattern of writing as past misinformation has used, that is something that can be picked up. Um, but if it's a question of similar kind of writing, but in a, um, it's actually uh, a piece of text that is commenting about the falseness of the previous version, the system will have difficulties making that distinction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the reasons why for a lot of um, sort of crucial decision making, it is still important to refer to fact checkers, to human judgment in these matters. However, there is a potential to use um, automated systems to do a sort of first level kind of removal of things that are very obviously um, uh, misinformation, such as the repostings of previous ones that have already been flagged up, which can uh, at least reduce the flow, the, the, the quantity of um, this kind of information going around. Okay, just a quick um, point is about fake, uh, deep fake. Is that also a serious kind of threat to the, you know, because uh, the deep fake is very difficult using the, using the technology to algorithm. So deep fakes have been attracting a lot of attention because of the novelty and um, sort of the, the wow factor of it. Uh, at current, deep fakes certainly are not sort of the main kind of issue that is at play. Uh, the quality of deep fakes at the moment is still not that excellent, so it can actually be, you can train systems to particularly look for the kinds of artifacts that you will find in deep fakes. Uh, rather, what is a more frequent uh, occurrence of misinformation is things such as old images that get reshared and relabeled as a new kind of incident, uh, mislabeling of, of kinds of events, um, shifting geographically of uh, things. So you get an image that was in reality from uh, 2000. Uh, seven or something in Iraq uh, getting labeled as a current incident in Syria or something like that. These are the more frequent kinds of events that are happening um, and can in some, they can be detectable by you looking back into sort of libraries of past um, 
past things have been uploaded, um, but they are more difficult to detect from the point of view of whether they have technical aberrations of them because they are effectively real images. They're just um, displaced. Okay, thank you. Then I think the way with the other measure maybe is capacity building, like a meter, have something. Yes. Out, so I would like to share something, you know, though it's not a best practice, what uh, before the 2019 elections in India, there was a lot of concern of the social media communication platforms being used or abused. But uh, surprisingly, we found the technology companies also complying to a certain extent or being more responsible, having the five uh, limiting forwards to five and restricting the, if someone exits from a group uh, in WhatsApp, for example, making, you know, having steps so that you know, a person has to be asked before the person can be again uh, be attached to the group. Um, Similarly, government also doing a lot of uh, capacity building amongst people to look at news before reacting. Um, in terms of curated online content and even media, they, they came together, especially the curated content providers came together to have their own self, uh, um, you know, having some kind of self-regulation so that not, um, and so that they can check that fake news is not moving through their platforms. So those were certain self-regulation which industry themselves tried to do. And obviously companies like Facebook and others put in advertisements even in newspapers and other media so that people can at least be aware uh, before reading any such news. Was some was actually a good um, move which actually helped but more needs to be done. So that is one best practice which we saw. And I just wanted to add here that um, we had a similar kind of a discussion in the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum where uh, you know there were certain uh, discussions which happened and uh, something which was interesting um, you know, which was raised, uh, and I would like to add, is there is a trust deficit. And many times what happens is the intent, if someone wants to regulate through regulations, the intent needs to be clear, as in what is it you want to address? Is it fake news, or uh, do you want to do it in a retrospective manner, or on a practical manner? Also, what is fake to someone may not be fake to someone else. Um, so those are certain questions which, when you talk of regulation, the current regulations which are prevalent in Asia um, are either too broad or too narrow. So uh, it's just not regulation which can help. And definitely, capacity building does help. And that's what we've been seeing through our capacity building engagement, uh, especially amongst young people, because they are the most ardent users of internet. Um, from 13 to uh, around 18, 19, we, and across different uh, socioeconomic conditions, they they are concerned about the news they receive, though they forward it, but they say we do not, we cannot validate, and that's where uh, you know fact checking, as Valid was mentioning, is important. It has to be inculcated in their curriculum. That's important. Even senior citizens, they have a mobile they're using, but they're not checking. For example, messages like two kidneys are available, please contact this number. Uh, as in kidneys are not give, given, it's not a share away thing, uh, but people are sharing it, uh, so and educated people doing that. So it's more on media literacy and digital literacy which needs to be done by governments, by private entities. I think Mina wants to add that. Um, the Real trust, quick, how do you uh, build a trust? Just as a bridge to your comment, I think one capacity building aspect is uh, building capacity of policymakers because just the, the understanding what deep fake is or, or, or what uh, information disorder means is a big thing and I was Pretty surprised that in 2018, the Council of Europe, um, I did some work for the policy work for them on this issue then, and the EU high-level expert group um, very quickly convened a multi-stakeholder group and started to think about this, which then resulted to the pushback on, on sort of regulatory or, or legal tools, but rather collaboration, uh, um, uh, self-governance, as you said, and quality journalism and fact-checking. But then I would like to ask all the other panelists and maybe you in the audience also, I've been trying to find information of how fact-checking works and what the impact of it is to follow up on that. And, and I, I think, yes, if I may, and then anybody in the audience, I would love to hear experiences of fact-checking. Yeah, we will come back to the, go back to the audience later, but uh, please, Valid, uh, you want to say something about fact-checking? I'm, I'm glad this landed on my lap because that's my cup of tea. And so I've, we've studied uh, the process of fact-checking uh, for the last few years, and we came to the conclusion that 
the fact-checking process in itself is evolving. They, there used to be very rudimentary steps of, okay, there's content, let's go into the content. Uh, the thing is that this is really incomplete. So we have now a three, which is a good practice and best uh, approach to fact-checking, is always have a three process. First, you need to identify what is the medium that has been used to propagate a message. The medium allows you to understand the, uh, the capacity of, of the individual content to be misinformation. For example, if the medium is a, a reputable news agency, it's different than having a medium which is a parody website. So uh, occasionally, I've seen journalists who took uh, a tweet and to, I mean, it appears to be true, but it turns out to be from a website that is a parody website. And they kept on going about, and, and they, yes, they didn't even fact check it, but they thought, okay, this is a medium that we trust. The other thing is that sometimes we have mediums that are multi-purpose and user generate. For example, a, a social media platform. It has Reuters and it has The Onion. So it, it, in this case, you move on to the next stage to look into the source. Who is the person or the entity behind this information? Then you analyze the source and understand from it how w the likelihood of this being um, misinformation. Then, at, if you come to the point, okay, now you've cleared these stages, you move on to the actual content. So you see, it's not as simple as jumping to the content. You need to look into the phases of this. And we at the Southern University have built a tool that allows our students and our uh, practicing journalists to use the tool to analyze these separately using various methods from, for example, if you're analyzing a medium, you know, you can look into the who is information of the medium. You know, when it was started, who is behind it. And for a source, you can look into their social media platform, uh, you can look into their history. Uh, content, you can do uh, reverse image searches using Google Images or Yandex and others. So this is a more methodological approach that we are trying to get students and journalists to learn. And it's not easy, but it's necessary if we are to improve the fact-checking process. OK, thank you, Valid. So how about the fact-checking in China? Is there any mechanism about the fact-checking in China? Thank you. Professor Xie. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of internet uses in China. Maybe a lot of person they uh, they just uh, maybe they just know the uh, internet, but they have no idea about the the true or false of the uh, information. Uh, I am very glad ab about uh, that the internet uses <coughs> should have the idea of that the information on the internet may be not true. So you'd better to uh, check the, the truth of the information. But it's hard for, for the uh, Chinese users to do that. Maybe you can have to, to judge uh, uh, information from different points. Uh, so it's hard to, 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 to check the the true or false of the information. So I think the, the government, uh, maybe the sources, uh, have the ob ob uh, obligation to, to give the truth to the public. And uh, the platform also have the uh, obligation to, to, to deal with the fake, new, fake news. Yeah. OK, yeah. this comes to our last question, which is about the role of the government. We will be very sh have a short comment from the panelists. So what do you think about the role of the government in this kind of the, you know, refuting or misinformation fake, fake news? Because there's a big concern about uh, whether it's reliable to you know, give the power to the government. And also, there's a concern about freedom of expression or privacy issue. Yes. So can anybody yeah, please comment, uh, comment on the role of the government? Anybody wants to say the role? Sure. Um, I'll tell you what I think the role of government is not going to be. Um, in Kenya, we just introduced a, a, a law that would require all bloggers and uh, all bloggers to be registered with the government, and a lot of social media monitoring, and then WhatsApp group members, all, uh, group leaders also have to be registered, and the group leaders are responsible for all the content on their group. I think that that is not the way the government should be involved in in, in regulating this, and. I, um, uh, I'll, tell, I'll talk later in my closing statement about, okay, yes. uh, about um, best practices, uh, and I think that that is overreaching uh, to be way, way beyond best practice. Okay. Yeah. So um, 
I feel governments have a responsibility because if there is an issue, every citizen goes back to the government. Because uh, if you look at uh, private companies, they have their interests, and which is valid. They have their business interests in mind. So if there is an issue, the last resort a person resorts to is the government. However, they should not be the only actors deciding things because there are other players who have to implement or go by those regulations. In India, for example, we have the intermediary draft which is being discussed currently, where uh, especially it is meant for the social media companies. And fortunately, intermediaries in India encompasses cyber cafes or anyone who is publishing and transferring information. Um, they're trying to narrow base it. There was a question. There was also um, a particular uh, clause which says um, pre, uh, you know, pre pre-checking uh, content, which actually is a concern for us. You should not be monitoring content before it passes through the pipe. So governments, I would say, has a role, but the other actors in this entire ecosystem have a role too, and they need to be in the table when decisions are made or policies are framed and even implemented. So it is not a one-zero game. Mm -hmm. It is a sharing and going together game. Okay. Michael, may I ask you about uh, the, the government role and the accountability issue about the government? You know, if they want to enforce this kind of check or the responsibility, what, how do we hold them accountable? Uh, basically, it, it is yeah. the general accountability for governments to ensure that if they come up with a law, that law must be agreed upon by the general citizenry. That law must not be one-sided. Uh, just recently, was it just last week or the other week, there was a vote at the UN where Russia, China, North Korea, Venezuela, and a group of countries are trying to push a bill within the UN framework on the cybercrime aspect, which somehow contravenes the Budapest Convention. Mm. If take time to read that, uh, that vote, and there will be another vote in the next, I think in the next coming two weeks or so. So basically, if you look at it, it's like, it's another way of stifling uh, freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. So just to come back to my point, is that despite government having the legal mandate to make laws, having the legal mandate to bring everyone on board, as my sister said here, to sit down, in a multi-stakeholder manner, where you discuss these laws to, to their logical conclusion and agree on all contentious issues before they are actually enacted. The other thing is government should take a deliberate policy to sensitize the general citizenry, to sensitize them on the dangers of misinformation, to tell them on the fact-checking measures, to say, if you receive this, if it doesn't sound as it is, you can go and check from trusted sources. But again, if you say trusted sources, who are these trusted sources? To me, BBC is a trusted source. It might not be for him, because probably the agenda BBC is pushing is not my agenda. It could be CNN for her to prove like a trusted source. It could not be for him, for her that side. So basically, if we were to define uh, in terms of uh, facts checking, which source can be trusted, that in itself actually leaves everything not balancing up. Because if you say fake news, who determines what fake news is? We don't ask that question. Governments mostly react during election times. There you see them with the right ending uh, strike, they will react because there's something at stake. Beyond elections, it's a razzia affair. They will go to sleep. Citizens will be peddling in uh, misinformation all over. There will be chaos, there will be problems. Some of these misinformation are meant to even, they come even from the business sector, trying to cripple the agendas of uh, the products of the other competitor. As a result, we find ourselves as the tools and agents of spreading this misinformation. We've all received some of this information which stops us from using a certain product because it will cause cancer. But we don't actually question the source of this information. So basically, the law still remains with the government to ensure that the general citizen are taught and they are explained to in terms of what, determine, what constitutes fake news. Thank you. OK, so, so um, I think we need to. Uh, okay. 
ask the audience, you know, their, uh, before that we have a question from the remote. Uh, so Nadira, I would like you to um, kind of... Yeah. Uh, that's a, uh, you can ask uh, uh, at the remote also. One is if they know of any best practices. Um, also, if there are any comments and way ahead, which they I, think. I will ask them yeah. later, but uh, because there is a question directly for the comment for, uh, about the Kenya. Uh, the question, I'm sure, from Kenya. Uh, it's uh, how successful was uh, registering bloggers and, uh, uh, and verify, verifying the Kenya government helped in stopping misinformation. And, and uh, just I want to add something from my. Uh, my research on uh, misinformation because a, a, a similar uh, practice was introduced in the United Arab Emirates and the, where they are fined if the uh, kind of the measure is they are fined if they uh, spread uh, misinformation. So uh, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, well fortunately from my perspective it was a, a draft only and never was actually implemented or, or, or voted into uh, to law. So it was, it was in fact roundly criticized by civil society and, and, and pretty much everybody outside uh, of government. And so, it was so much so that they act, the government withdrew it recently and said we, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do it like this, we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board. So um, I don't know if this has been done in, in Uganda, is that? Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's been done in Uganda. A lot of a lot of our social media laws seem to be modeled after Uganda, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was where it, it was originally uh, propagated. But but we didn't actually do it. Oh, yeah, but it's been done in the United Arab Emirates, by the way. Okay, so there's uh, any. Sorry. Anyone has comments or questions? Yeah. So one, then Satish, and you can raise your hand. You just come. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, my name is David Christopher. I'm from IFEX, which is a global network of free expression uh, organizations. So my, my question is kind of building on the discussion around laws that are designed to tackle fake news and also a bit about the use of AI uh, in terms of uh, co content takedowns. Uh, there's a huge amount of concern uh, out there uh, within the free expression community about the spread, more and more countries uh, bringing in uh, laws I think uh, along the lines of the one in uh, the draft one uh, in Kenya, a uh, report by Freedom House, which is one of our members, uh, had said it's like it's over 17 uh, different examples, different countries bringing in uh, these types of laws. And th th there clearly there's a lot of uh, overreach there. I think sometimes these laws are being brought in with benign intentions, um, even though they're, they're poorly drafted, they're sort of Genuinely, the aim is to tackle uh, disinformation, but in many other cases, the aim is to stifle criticism, stifle dissent, uh, basically clamp down on uh, freedom of expression. So I guess my, my question is, I'd love to hear the thoughts of the panel on what safeguards are needed uh, in order to protect uh, freedom of expression and also to ensure that legitimate speech isn't uh, taken down. Uh, especially by AI uh, content takedown mechanisms that are, you know, with our current technology, not clever enough to really understand the context. Thank you. Okay. We have, we'll take three questions and okay, then yeah. we'll... Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, um, somewhat building on that, um, my... So my name is Malcolm Hutty. Um, the short version of my question is so old I could ask it in Latin, who watches the watchman? Um, the slightly longer version. The second speaker said that he came from a country where the risk of fake news and rumors was particularly serious because it was plausible to believe, people found it plausible to believe, terrible things of the government and terrible things of what corporations might be aiming to do. And that, that prompts me to wonder, is it more dangerous to allow people to believe such terrible things of their government and the companies and the consequences that might flow them from that? Or is it more dangerous to allow the government and such companies that might well plausibly believe to be acting in such a way to have the power to prevent them from knowing such things? Now, since the real answer in this is probably we're looking for a bit more nuance than these binaries, I guess my, the, the more subtle question is, 
should we be looking to construct a mechanism to suppress fake news and disinformation and rumors and all these things? and then seek forms of mitigations and safeguards, such as the previous questioner asked? Mm -hmm. Or should we instead be not implementing such controls on information, but instead be seeking to mitigate the negative effects of misinformation and fake news and rumors? Thank you. Thank you. Satish, quick question, in two minutes. Sir. Yeah, thanks. My name is Satish, and I'm from India. I have a quick comment on the, uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I have a comment uh, on the best practice. Uh, two years back, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, launched something called Wikitribune. And last month, that was you know, taken forward to one more step, which is the wiki wt.social, which is a Twitter-like platform. Now, these two are actually specifically targeted at fake news. And it started two years back. And it uses human-curated uh, you know, sourcing of articles. And it's supposed to be a very major step forward in the fight against fake news. So, just for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question from the lady, and we, they can okay. answer it. Yeah, it takes the last question, then we will. And we'll come back to this side. Um, hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Samha. And um, I'm originally from Tanzania, and there's been a lot of East African uh, policies brought up. So, as a fellow East African, I care. Um, do you, because as we know, as, as the Africans who are here, we're not. Um, we already, we're not used to people spreading misinformation about us. So I feel like sometimes there is a natural skepticism or a natural mistrust when information comes concerning our government or our people. Um, so my question is, do you feel like the common African or the common East African um, who isn't part of the media, because obviously the laws with the bloggers in Kenya, they are, they're doing that similarly in Tanzania as well, where you have to actually pay to be a blogger or to be an influencer. It's not a job you can just enter into. Um, do you think the common African cares about misinformation because of that natural skepticism about, well, just another lie that I can I already know is a lie? Okay, so yeah, please. And Asaka, do you want to f f give a response first and then probably Michael and Valida? All right, um, I'll, I'll answer the last question first. Such a fantastic question, um, and one of the challenges, well, maybe not challenge, one of the things that we realized doing, in, in doing the research is that the average Kenyan, at least, and I can, I can speak of the average Kenyan, but not, maybe not the average African, the average Kenyan, let me not say doesn't care about whether it's fake news or not, but would rather have restrictions on speech then, then would ha then the opposite, which is anyone can say anything about anyone they want, which leads to ethnic tensions and and real pro real problems like physical problems. So I think um, when you approach these topics from the more free speech, human rights kind of uh, perspective, you you miss that um, that nuance, and and you don't actually get the the support of uh, the general public when you're trying to advocate for such things. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll let my yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, please, Michael. Uh, just to answer her question, does an average Kenyan or African care about fake news? Let's go back 26 years ago to the genocide in Rwanda. Assume the genocide happened now, when everyone has a tool to check whether the news being spread is fake or not. Basically, before then, the news that the f misinformation was spread through radio back then in 1994. Propaganda news here and there, almost a million people lost their lives. Now imagine now that the same thing happened where images would be imported from Nigeria, where you know those al-Shabaab or whatever you call them, and they are linked to say, these people are in your area, or these are the uh, people that your government has hired to probably strike on those ones whose views do not actually necessarily agree with those on government. It will definitely affect you. Misinformation affects each one, each and every one of us, directly or indirectly. We may not actually feel the effect now, 
but along our daily lives, in one way or the other, it will affect us. So basically, to answer your question, in average, African must actually take the responsibility to ensure that they are able to filter fake news and make the right decision of not forwarding that which they have received based on those morals of saying, what's the point of me forwarding this? What am I going to gain? Am I just being a tool or a carrier of news that is not worthy or, a, a, or news that is going to bring tribal hate speech or anything that is going to bring division within the country? So basically, every African must care and understand that actually misinformation is and always be important in terms of the way we live. Without it, everything goes. Okay, and Walida, please. Um, a wonderful set of questions, but let me address a couple of them. One of them about the whether it's a good idea to mitigate or deal with the effects of misinformation. I, like, I find this uh, very uh, thought-provoking because in both sides, of course, you ideally want to not have disinformation, but now that you have it, perhaps that's uh, a, a matter of treatment rather than prevention this question. I'll give you an example of uh, this uh, a study has been done on the French elections in, in 2017. It was um, a matter of understanding what, would, uh, what was the main reaction of the public, especially the supporters of Le Pen the, uh, at the time, the candidate, the right-wing candidate, what was the reaction to cases where journalists fact-checked and very obviously showcased that this was a lie, or this was disinformation, and pro presented this information to the voters. Guess what happened? They still didn't believe the fact checks. They still believed, okay, I, I, my gut feeling tells me this is the candidate for me, and re disregarded the fact checks themselves. And later on, they realized that over time, politicians were able to use this characteristic of the echo chamber or the you know uh, the um, persuasion effect of speaking to your beliefs confirmation bias and so they use that effectively through very creative storytelling so when the way you storytell may actually defeat the fact whether it is I mean, uh, factual or not you can say a fairy tale and if it appears to you very beautiful very genuine even if it's totally f f fake, it would be used as a way to vote. That's unfortunately the reality. So again, the question is, in fact, would it ever matter if you fact check is a very uh, appropriate question to ask. The other, I mean, I think I have run out of time, but I'll... Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else wants to, yeah. Uh, Professor Chair, because I know uh, this is also the similar situation in China. For example, like people tend to believe in rumors and believe in rumors as truth. Where truth is rumor, is that right? You want to say There's something? A, is there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in China, just uh, I have an example. Just uh, like in my family, the uh, my uncle or my aunt, they are maybe more than sixty years old. They always have received a lot of uh, fake news rumors. Just like the, they, uh, they usually uh, give the information to me to let me to check if it's true or, or false. Just like the, the government will give more money for the retired, the, the retired person. I, I always give, the, give them the, to tell them that the information is easily to, to understand that it's, it's, false, it's a false news. If, the government will give you the money. They will, they will give the policy to the public, not just from someone else, uh, someone else the, the information on the internet. Yeah. So uh, this is very important for the internet users to, to know that the information on the internet is, is most of, uh, there are a lot of the fake news on the internet. So the, the government will give the, uh, the true infor information for the public and that the platform also will give the, to control the fake news to spread on, the, on its uh, platform, yeah. Thank you. Um, could I just briefly answer the question? 
question regarding sorry, the sorry. Uh, AI okay. systems and the potential of overzealous use of these kinds of systems. As I mentioned, uh, they can be useful, but they are severely limited, and, and there is a large gray area where it's best not to let an AI be the final arbiter. One of the key issues is really what are the incentives here for the platform that's using it. Is it, as in the case with, uh, for instance, a lot of copyright takedowns, that the platform will feel the incentive is such that when in doubt, take it down. Um, in the worst case, they will upload it again. Uh, so one direction to think about is a need for transparency around what has been taken down, generating a kind of cache of removed content that can be reviewed, will be reviewed by um, a public, uh, public methodology, other journalists and the government, not just one or the other, and to have consequences for uh, any company that is taking down too many things uh, that shouldn't have been. So it's about making sure that the balance of incentive is right and isn't completely skewed towards uh, let's just keep let's just keep taking everything down or in the other side just leave everything on. Hello, um, my name is Stephen Wright. I'm uh, with the Canadian Federal Public Service. Um, I have a question about digital media literacy. Um, it's, I guess you could say, often touted as maybe uh, maybe a silver bullet, um, or maybe that we might not even need uh, to get into all these complex uh, issues about you know freedom of expression and, and human rights and regulation um, if we just have really good digital media literacy. Um, so I'm wondering, for the panel, uh, the extent to which you believe that's true, um, whether. Um, solid digital media literacy programming and, and curricula can actually solve this problem? Um, and what does good uh, literacy practice, what, is that, what does that look like? Um, and if you could just talk about maybe, maybe some best practices that you're aware of, because uh, that's something we're, we're trying to tackle uh, on the Canadian front. Hi, uh, Simone Niemes, also from Canada, uh, but I'm at Charles University in Prague. Um, I was just curious if any of the countries have any experience with, uh, instead of targeting the people who are sharing, because this seems to be a problem that's equal in every country in the world, but instead targeting the content creators, um, and if there's any best practices that have worked uh, to contact, uh, target those people. Okay, and so I think Amita wants to answer the Yes, I guess even you would want to. Add. So when we're talking about digital literacy, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, I'll just give you an analogy. Okay, if um, for our health, you are told certain good things to do, like for example, walk, eat a certain amount of food, uh, you know, so that you lead a healthy and long life. Uh, but that's not, you may still fall ill and for that you need medicines, you need doctors. Similarly, in the digital world, there are some best practices which an individual can follow if you can teach them how to do, you know, practice that. But at the end of the day, you also need the people who are providing those services to be a bit more responsible, uh, the government who looks after things uh, to at, at least protect your interests, not only their interests. So it's not um, digital literacy or media literacy does help to make an individual conscious about what their rights are, what they are signing off to when they say, I accept, when they're you know, taking a service. And if they have not uh, accepted certain things, but still their data is being shared, they know whom to reach to. Unfortunately, most of the people today do not know how their data is used. Uh, we get free services, but we do not know what we are exchanging for that. So they need to be aware. They need to know that their rights are not abused. And that's why digital literacy needs to be there. If I'm conscious and I make a decision, that's my call. I have to face the music. But if I do not know and someone is taking me for a ride, that's not my fault. So yes, it is important, but it is all the stakeholders who needs to work. Everyone can just shrug off, say, okay, digital literacy is the only thing. No, that's one of the things. Just a quick, actually I want to give you a quick uh, response which is I, I wrote a policy document about public service and, and misinformation and media literacy examples around Europe. So I'll give you the link. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll address. This was actually going to be my closing statement, but I'll, I'll use it here anyway. Um, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll cite to the New York Times in two so seemingly in contradictory ways. First of all, the, the New York Times uh, is kind of the, to me, the poster child of how good media ought to be done, right, with a lot of uh, fact checking and, and really, you know, in-depth um, looking into stories before you publish and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, in, in my generation and older, people came to uh, rely on such media houses as the ultimate fin definitive source of information, right? So it's all the news that's fit to print. Fit meaning they have really looked into it. You can rely and trust this information. So I'm, <laughs> I'm in several WhatsApp groups and I've noticed that the older someone is, the more likely they are to believe anything that comes through uh, the, the WhatsApp group. So I think that is because that they have been trained and conditioned to believe if it's published, then it's probably true. It, it, we don't have any young people on this audience. Uh, I've got, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think if you asked anybody who's under 30, and I, well, okay, I know, if you ask people who are under 30, fake news is, is, is curious and interesting, but not really so much of an issue because they've grown up with that as, their is, as, as the problem, right? Like, they know how to go and check multiple sources. They know how to deal with things that are not true. They're not fooled by a, most of this stuff. They, they, that's just the way that they've grown up dealing with these things. No, so, but in the developing nations, the country I've come from, I, uh, they are, and in India, young people are confused. They really do not know where they need to check and how they can validate what they're receiving is right. And this is something which the last two months with 5,000 students, that's what we found. They say we do not know how to uh, validate if it's true or false. We get it, we share it. Well, I, th uh, I think that shows the granularity of the, of the situation because in Kenya, the young people I interact with don't, don't deal, I mean, they don't have this problem. Right? Just also regarding the fake news, uh, refuting this, news, I want to bring the case in the Middle East, where most of the fake news uh, kind of uh, bring uh, some phrases from the Quran, which uh, affects the emotional effects, and that's kind of hard to refute it. So it's, it's an issue, uh, and I, I'm not sure if uh, Walid can have a, a, a fact checked about that, if, if you have an answer on it. Yeah, religion is a very dicey issue these days. But you have to be quick, Walid. We just uh, very have, quick. Um, yeah. We have a very popular website called Feta Bayanu. It's a, an Arabic website. And it, it turned out that the section on religion is one of the most popular because it's one that has so many rumors around it, given that they use that extensively. So yes, it's possible to get this done through a systematic fact-checking method. But, uh, and it also sh plays into, uh, in support of Amrita, is that there are many, many who simply believe because it's you know, aligned with their own religious thoughts. So it's a psychological issue maybe around you know, confirmation bias. If it looks like it's almost true, I would believe it, even if I'm not sure. I think um, you would, uh, no, no more questions as in, you know, though there is a lot more discussion which we can have, but a quick one-liner from all the panelists on their wish list of what they think would be the ideal situation to deal with misinformation. We got uh, online questions. Yes, uh, so I would like to ask each of your speakers to summarize the, you know, the, the way you move forward in one sentence. Thank you. I think that my previous, uh, of the comments by previous colleagues showed what we really need to do. We really need to understand different contexts, different age groups. We live in a global uh, uh, platform society at the same time. We still have our national, regional, and local context. We need to understand that better if we want to solve this problem, not only technology. Sorry. Uh, one sentence. We we, in the la recently, we have really um, put technology majors uh, on a pedestal. And I think we need to go back and say, wait a minute, these other social science majors, history, uh, English, uh, uh, anthropology, uh, all of those majors, pol political science, we need, to, we need to make those sexy again. We need to make those desirable to people because those are the majors that those are the majors where people learn how to interrogate these things and really uh, if we have more of those people in society at certain some point you have a critical mass of, of people who 
who are skeptical of this sort of information. There was a question which says, should we go to the source of the fake news or the carrier of the fake news, which I feel was not answered. So basically it's both. If you know what you are transmitting is fake, you go ahead because you may not be held responsible because the source is known. You are as good as the source. Because responsibility starts with, you, you read what you receive. Then you decide to transmit it to another person either through Facebook or any other media platforms, it simply means you're as good as the source. So basically the same punitive measures that are in place for the source should also actually affect you. Because the moment we start fearing that, should I transmit this, the next person who receives it will tag you as the source. Thank you. Um, I'd like to simply approve the message of a multidisciplinary, uh, multifaceted approach. No one size fits all. We come from different backgrounds, different countries, and uh, that's where we believe strongly in the need to collaborate among us as uh, technologists as well as academics, and uh, only then would we find long-term solutions. So while I think that there is a place for technology to help with uh, reducing the size of the issue, what I would say here is uh, one of the main things to look at, I think, is uh, the impact that a particular kind of uh, misinformation from a particular kind of source has. So basically, thinking about the authority, authority figures and misinformation from authoritative uh, persons and uh, the kinds of consequences that should come from authority figures uh, abusing their kind of messaging. So fake news from a politician should weigh differently than fake news from your uncle. Uh, fake news from someone who is seen as a representative of the medical um, profession should weigh differently from someone who is not similar to with um, accredited journalists and so forth. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the law is the last measure to deal with the fake news. And I hope the technology will deal with most of the fake news. And uh, I think it's very important for the government to education the public uh, from the ch children to tell them how to uh, differ the, the information from fake news. Uh, yeah. okay. okay, thank you for the speakers. So we finished here, just a summary. And uh, so we seem uh, we agree there uh, must be a multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary approach. And uh, we will also, it's a very complicated issue, we will produce a report on this panel and uh, upload to the uh, IGF uh, webpage. In case you have any comments, you can always send it to us. We welcome your comments. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the, all these speakers. Thank you. Thank you.